good life. I like to live the good life. It's okay. I understand sometimes people go through difficult situations. And I know there are times that the Bible says weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. The Bible says uh, uh, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Or the Bible says that the Lord delivers them out of them all. I see Christians walking around sad, and I really wonder why. I know that you can go through, I know that you go through persecution. I know that you go through some hard things. But listen, if you've got no other to, reason to rejoice in your life other than the fact that you're saved, that ought to be enough. I'm rejoicing because someday I'm going to heaven. I mean, the devil, if I'm stupid enough to let the devil jump on me without rebuking him and sending him away, if I allow a whole bunch of things to come in my life, the worst he could do is kill this body, but then my spirit's going to go immediately into the presence of God. I, I tell you, I'm not worried. Amen? I tried worried. It, wasn't uncomfortable. it was really uncomfortable for me, so I don't do that anymore. But we've talked about how God wants us to have the very best. You know, Jesus said, what man, if his son were to ask him for bread, would he give him a stone? And if he were to ask him for a fish, would he give him a snake? If we, being wicked, know how to give good things to our children, how much more will a heavenly father? Now listen, I want to be on the how much more. That's the side I'm on. I'm on the side of God who is the God of how much more. <laughs> Amen? And there can be... If he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think according to the power that works in me, then guess what? I'm going to ask and think some pretty big things. Listen to me. Got to have your expectations up high. But we talked last week and the last couple of weeks that we already know that God is on our side. Paul the Apostle said that, that God's special favor was put on him. I am mean, talking about Joseph, he said, uh, that, that God's uh, favor was upon Joseph, and not only that, God gave him unusual wisdom. I know what you're thinking. There's some wives out here thinking right now, if my husband got wisdom, that would be unusual. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. But anyway, I'm just telling you, unusual wisdom. In other words, and, and then Paul even said this, and not without results. So we understand we have the favor of God. We looked in 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, and it says that lay hold of the divine favor that's been offered to you. Amen? We have the favor of God not because of what we do, because of what Jesus did. Everyone say it's all about Jesus. And Jesus went to that cross so that we could walk in the very best. We'd be saved? Yes. But you really think that's all that he wanted was just for us to be saved? That word saved, by the words, uh, way, is the word sozo, and it means to be healed, to be, be tranquil, to be every good thing you can think of is wrapped up in that word saved. The truth about it is he wants us healed, and he wants us set free, and he, wa he wants us delivered from every kind of a evil thing that tries to get. I want to tell you, God wants us to live a good life. So that's what we're talking about. So we talked last week, and we said, you know what? The truth about it is, is that God wants us to have a good life, and he has shown his favor in our lives. We have, uh, uh, for the most part, we have good lives. If something goes wrong, it's because we've allowed it to happen or we've allowed the devil to do it, but God didn't put us on it. You know, you'll never receive from God as long as you think that God is the author of disease and sickness and poverty and everything. Whenever you think like that, you won't receive God's best. But I know that God wants me to be, do well in life. Do well. How many people in here are parents? Don't you want your children to do well? And the Bible says even though compared to God, we're wicked, and we want, our, we want our kids to do well. How much more will our Heavenly Father give unto those that ask? I want to tell you. Now, we're going to turn in our Bibles to Psalm 1 because we discussed last week that we, got, we already know God's on our side, but the question was, are we on His side? Did you know if you want to be poor, broke, busted, disgusted, and miserable in life, He'll allow you to do that? He's not going to force the good life on you. But you can receive by faith. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Man, they're talking about us. He's a rewarder of who? Us. He talks about favor given to man. Who's that? That's us. 
Well, we know he's on our side, but we are we on his side? Because there is a way for you to go about in life and decide, I'm smart enough to figure things out. You can live your life in such a way that you decide, I'm going to take care of me. And I remember years ago saying, you've got to take care of number one before you can help anybody else. I'm going to tell you, that's wrong. I talked about in marriage, in the marriage, married couples fellowship the other night, I talked about how uh, we have it completely wrong. They write self-help books so people can help with their marriage. So here you have uh, the, the husband in one place, the wife over there, and they're discussing in a natural way, they're discussing how they can work out their problems. All of that is happening here on the natural plane. So they get natural answers and not supernatural answers. I know because when they sit in front of me, I'll say, well, how's everything going? And what do I hear? She'll say, well, he's doing this and this. Can you believe that, Pastor? He's doing this and this and that. And he won't do this or that. But he always does the other. And then he'll say, yeah, but the problem is she won't do this or that. And she always wants to do the other. So in a natural, on the natural plane, I'm going to show you what the, how this applies. In, in the natural plane, they try to work out their problems between each other. So they get natural solutions instead of supernatural solutions. But when you get two people who have decided to make God absolutely number one in their life. Now, the husband is seeking God and his wisdom. And to be more like God and to trust in God. And he has an intimate relationship with God. An odd thing happens. He becomes more and more like Jesus as he seeks God. And when the wife is over here, instead of looking in the natural plane and, and having this go on with the husband, she is looking to God. And she's trusting in God. And she spends more time with God. She becomes more and more like Jesus. Now, all of a sudden, the old problems they thought they had, they don't have anymore. Because if you've got two people that are seeking God, they both have the same mind about things. Does that make sense? But you've got to get out of this natural thinking. Well, this is what this set of scriptures is getting ready to tell us right here. In Psalm 1, it said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And, and you know, who wants their leaf to wither? No, anyway. And whatever he does... <laughs> Father, help me. <laughs> and whatever he does, <laughs> if you want to pray for your pastor, pray that everything that <laughs> everything he hits his head doesn't hit his mouth. That's the deal. And whatever he does, say whatever. Amen. Whatever he does shall prosper. Now, as we're going through these scriptures, I'm going to tell you, there's a powerful thing in this world, and, and it's, it's the power to decide what's going to happen to you in life. You, because your decisions, uh, they're what's going to affect where you go in life. So you can hear this as I preach, and, and, and all the nonsense that I say, set it aside. But what I say about the Word, listen, you can receive that and say, I'm going to put that to work in my life. Or you can decide, hey, I want to do what I want to do. And guess what? This scripture no longer applies to you if you're going to do your own thing. But listen. He said, whatever he does shall prosper, and the, but the ungodly are not so. Uh, but are a chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And I'm going to read this out of the New Living. He said, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit 
uh, each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked, for they're like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They'll be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the, the godly, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Every day, you have decisions to make. Every day. You know, uh, uh, I said this yesterday at the men's conference. You know, when I get up in the morning, God doesn't grab a hold of me, slam me to my knees, and make me pray. That's my decision. And every day that I live on this earth, God doesn't grab me, slam me into the chair, and have me open up my Bible and study my Bible. I get to decide whether I'm going to do that. Now, now the factor that's, that's important here is, is what I want to do more important than what God wants me to do. Because the reality of it is, do you, do you really think, now I really do love the word, but, but do you think every time uh, th that I'm disciplined enough to read the word, it's because I really want to stop and read the word at that time? No. Do you think every time I pray, it's because I want to pray? No. Here's one for you. Do you think every Sunday morning I really want to come to church? No. This morning, I really wanted to get up here and say this right here. Gorgeous day. Go fishing. Go to the zoo. But I'm not having church. I'm going to go ride my motorcycle. <laughs> Listen, I'm telling you that when you start deciding you're going to do what God wants you to do, it, it's a self-sacrificing life. It's you have to do as Jesus said to deny self, to pick up your cross and Deny yourself and follow him. Self wants some things that are not good for me. How many people know what I'm talking about? Does self want things? Yeah. Self wants things that, that are not good for me. Pecan pie. Heat it up. With a, yes. With a dip of ice cream. Father, we thank thee. Yeah, we love those kind of things, you know. But, you know, uh, depending on where you are uh, with your body, that may not be a healthy thing for you to eat. So you'd have to get disciplined and do something that's, that God wants you to do. I want to tell you this. You know, God will guide you in how to invest your money, how, what you should eat, how you should exercise, how, how you operate in your relationships with your spouse and with other people. He will lead at you in all that you do in this life. He'll do that if you allow him to. You know, some people are not good at following instructions. Some people don't realize how important instructions are. I'm going to read you this story. A young man was learning to be a paratrooper. Before his first jump, he was given these instructions. Jump when you're told. Count to ten and pull the ripcord. In the unlikely event that your chute doesn't open, pull the emergency ripcord. When you get down, a truck will be there to take you back to the airfoil. So the young Young soldier memorized these instructions, climbed aboard the plane. The plane climbed to 10,000 feet. Paratroopers began to jump. When the soldier j was told to jump, he jumped. And then he counted to 10. He pulled the ripcord. Nothing happened. His chute failed open. So he pulled the emergency ripcord. Still nothing happened. No parachute. Oh, great, he thought. And I suppose the truck won't be here either to get me to the airfield. <laughs> Have you ever felt like that? You felt like everything is going... Have you had those days when it feels like nothing is going right? Inevitably, when I have a day when nothing's going right, I guarantee you I'm going to get up, bare feet, and slam my foot into some kind of piece of furniture and stub my toe. Then I will not be angry at myself. I'll be mad at that furniture for being there. But there are times you go to reach for your keys, you drop them. You grab your phone, you drop it. You head out to go do something, you left your Bible at home, and you're going to go minister to somebody. And things like that, and there'll be days that are, that, that are just not good. But everybody has those days. Everybody. The Bible says, think, not think it not strange about the fiery trials you're going through. Guess what? A lot of people are going through things. Everybody's going through something. Amen? Life isn't always perfect. Life isn't always going to go along just like a summer breeze. I mean, sometimes it, it gets stormy. But 
what does it take to be a person who always lands on their feet? I mean, how can you do that? The truth about it is you've got to start out by recognizing God. I believe this about God. I believe this because I have a heart for God, that I want to do what God's will is for my life. Because of that, I believe even when I don't do well, he's going to bless me because he knows my heart. Really. He might call me to do something, and I really lost it up, and he'll bless me anyway. You know why? He's the God of grace and mercy, and he knows my heart. Amen? But the first thing he said here in the first, verse 1, he said that we're blessed by God. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delights in the law of the Lord. The law he meditates day and night. I love how it says this verse in the Amplified. He said, blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable. That's a good description of blessed. That's me. Say that. That's me. Say, I'm happy. I'm fortunate. I'm prosperous. And I'm enviable. That means the people that are not listening to God, the wicked out there, should be looking at our blessed life and saying, man, I want what he has. I want what he has. There's something about that guy. Or that girl. There's something about them. In the midst of the hard things in life, they still have that internal joy. But the, why is that? Because the person that lives a blessed life under God, we've already instructed, one that's decided to put God first and themselves second. Many people are, are so involved that they're self-centered instead of God-centered. It's a problem. Why would Jesus say to not deny self unless that was the problem? It really is the problem. I want what I want. You, you get a, a little toddler and they want what they want. And they want it now. You know, uh, I was reminded of that when uh, Mason was over there and uh, he was getting ready to go swimming to a swim deal and Debbie had grabbed the wrong swim trunks. He wanted the Superman swim trunks. And he wasn't going to put on any other swim trunks but that. So finally Debbie had to say, listen to, you, listen to this. You don't have your Superman swim trunks. So we're going to just leave you here because uh, you, you, you can stay home with Grandpa because I tell you what, you, you don't, if you're not going to wear swim trunks and put them on right now, you don't get to go with us. He said, okay. And he put on the swim trunk. What was the problem? He wanted what he wanted. But did you know as you mature in the Lord, you should get to the place where you want God, what God wants more than what you want? Does that, make, does that make sense? You might have desires for things. You want to make sure you get what you want when you want. No, that's a toddler's attitude. But a mature Christian's attitude is decided, I, I'm drawn close to God and, and what God wants for me. That's what I want from me too. In the Psalms, true satisfaction involves not just enjoying yourself, but taking a real delight in what God wants for your life. That's the secret of lasting joy. The goal of life for, for, for King David was for every believer today. Uh, it's not found in self-fulfillment, but in spending time with the Lord. That's the important thing. Somebody say, that's important. The second thing is, he tells us that we're blessed in Christ in verse 3. Uh, uh, and I love Psalm 1 because of this. It says, a fruitful tree, uh, he says, uh, uh, is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. I don't know where Christians got to the place where they no longer thought that they could claim those scriptures. I claim that scripture. I seek after God, and then I'll say with my own mouth. I'll say it because I, have, I am what I think, and I, and I have what I say. I'll say what the Word of God says. So I'll say this. I'll say, Lord, I delight in your teaching. I delight in your presence inside of my life. I thank you, and I praise you for that. And I thank you that whatever I do prospers. I thank you, Lord, that 
Years ago when the church wasn't here, where we would start thanking God. We thank you, God, that there's going to be a church building sitting right here. I thank you, Lord, that, it, that even though all my friends or many of my friends told me nobody will come to a church way out in the country. In fact, I had a good preacher friend of mine said, nobody's going to come. He said, if you build that church there. I said, he said, I'm just telling you, I'm experienced. I know about this. I've been around a long time. I said, would you drive from Springfield for just $10 and a hot lunch? He said, no. Would you come up here if I gave you $1,000 and a hot lunch? Yeah, probably. So it really isn't the distance. It's the value of what you get when you get there. Amen. Amen. But I believe God. I believe that if God, that I'm spending time with the Lord, and the Lord told us to build a church out here, that God obviously had a purpose for it. Amen. And so, so we started doing it, following God. Do you know what? I, that means that I can go like this, and I, I can say, "Thank you, Lord." that I am prosperous and everything I have my hands into. Deuteronomy 28 says that because I hearken to the voice of the Lord, he'll bless all that I have my hands into. I believe that. Can you say that? Say that. Say that. Because I delight in the Lord. He prospers me. He blesses all I have my hands into. You know why? Because we live the good life. That's what living the good life is about. Living the good life is that you don't get to say, I have the favor of God, so I'll live any way I want to, and God will bless me. That's not how that thing works. You say, I have the favor of God because of what Jesus did, so I'm going to get involved in his principles. Amen? I'm going to live according to what God wants, and I know that I'll abide in that blessing. I'm like a tree that's planted by the water, and whatever I do prospers. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. There are sometimes, that there, there are sometimes Christians who start out, they accept Christ as their Savior, and then later down the road they decide they want to go do their own thing, and, and, uh, and they're, not, they're not staying plugged into God. And then they wonder why things start going downhill. Inevitably, many of them will call me up and say, you know, I've been gone away from the church a long time. I haven't been serving the Lord. Things don't seem to be working out. And I go, yeah. Why don't you reverse what you just told me? Start coming to church again. Start serving God and, and trusting him. Maybe those things will turn around. What do you think? Does that make sense? So we stay plugged in. It's, there's more blessings in the new covenant because it's a better covenant than what there was under the old covenant. Here's some blessings of knowing Jesus. God, number one, God forgives all our sins. According to Matthew 26, 28, Acts 13, 38, our sins are not merely covered by the blood of bulls and goats. They're paid for and taken away by the Lamb of God, by His blood upon that cross. Justice is satisfied. I have His forgiveness and His complete forgiveness. So God has forgiven all my sin. That's a blessing. Amen. Number two, God remembers my sin no more. Oh, that's what, he, that's what he told us again. So in Hebrews 8, 12 and 10, 17, if I was to come to God and say to him, you remember when I did that back then? God, that was terrible. I shouldn't have acted that way. He goes, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. God is omnipotent. He actually has the ability, and because he's omniscient, he, he knows everything. God is the only being in the universe has the ability to forget. And Debbie, don't say anything. I know I've been forgetting more lately, so don't get smart aleck or anything sitting over there. <laughs> God doesn't remember our sin. In terms of justification, it's as if we never sinned. Number three, in this new covenant, what? We are trees planted by a river of living water. So number three, God promises never to be angry with us again. Is anybody glad about that? In Isaiah 54, 7 through 10, unlike that old covenant of the law, the new covenant is an everlasting covenant of love and peace. God will never stop doing good to us. Anybody glad about that? Come on, this is better preaching than what you're amening. Number four, if you're taking notes, God qualified us. There are some people who say, you know, I, I, I just don't feel like I'm, I'm right. Listen to me. God, when you accepted yes, when you accepted Jesus, when you said yes to Jesus, I want to tell you something. 
uh, you took hold of such a wonderful gift, and it's God who qualified you through what Jesus did. That's in Colossians 1.12. It's no longer a case of what we do under the law covenant or who we're related to under the Abrahamic covenant. It's who we trust, and we trust in God. Number five, Jesus takes hold of us and never lets go. Mm. Philippians 3.12 and John 24. Listen to me. And Jude 24. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Our hope is firm and it's secure. Number six. God credits us with perfect righteousness of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21. I better move on. Number seven, God gives us the Holy Spirit to teach us and empower us and remind us of our righteousness. We no longer need priests to meditate for us. We can all know God and have a relationship with God. Are you glad about that? Number eight, God is for us. The Bible said if God's be for us, then who can be against us? So God, say that. God's on my side. God is for us. God justifies us, and there's no more condemnation. Romans 8, 1. When we sin, Jesus doesn't judge us. He defends us at 1 John 2, 1. I mean, how can it get better? His grace enables us to overcome sin in Titus 2, 12. He abundantly supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. Philippians 4, 19. We can enjoy the good life. I'm happy about this today. Can you tell? Well, people say, well, why is this so important? Well, let me ask you this. Why are you on Facebook and every other thing complaining about your life if you're really living the good life? Why are you, why are you calling all your friends about your, ter tell them about your terrible life if you really understand what it is to live the good life? I've got nothing to complain about because I understand who I am in Christ and what he's done for me. Aren't you glad about that today? God is, uh, uh, God is for us, and, and, and God is with us. In Ezekiel 37, 20, says, because of Jesus, the door to the throne room is always open. Hebrews 4, 16. I, whatever I need, I can approach that throne of grace and talk to God about it. Amen? Number 10, God empowers us to overcome the enemy. He not only forgave sin, but he gave me the power to overcome the enemy. He gives us power over all the power of the enemy. In uh, 1 John 5, 4, we have, uh, we have his delegated authority. Are you glad about that? Number 11, God offers us his rest. Now listen, this is something to really understand. When you find a Christian who's really happy, inevitably it's because he finally figured out that I have entered into the rest of Jesus. I am trusting in what God has done rather than trusting on what I can do. Amen. I know God loves me. You know why? Come on. Did you ever go to Sunday school? Because the Bible tells me so. Amen. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And all of us to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. Number 11, so it gives us rest. And the 12th one is God gives us eternal life. So we are the people that are planted by the streams of living water. I know when Christians are sad, it's because they don't have a revelation of what God's done. What do I got to be sad about? I remember years ago, a guy came up to me and said, you know what? Uh, my finances have went down to nothing, and I'm going to lose my house. What are people going to say? They're going to say that you lost your house. Well, I may lose my car, too. Then they'll say you lost your house and your car. He said, how can you smile? I said, it's not my house and car. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> 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 no, but the truth about it is, how can a person go through those kind of difficulties in life and, and keep their attitude straight? You know why? Because they're not trusting in what they can do. I'm going to tell you, if God shuts a door, he'll open another one. Amen. I'm going to guarantee you right now. You may have gone like this and said, you know what? My job is, is, is coming to an end. Now what? 
I don't know, maybe God got off the throne and we're, it's all over. Well, that didn't happen. Oh, so God's still on the throne. All right, well then, if uh, you're losing your job, God will open a door to one that is better. I said better. Amen? And that needs to be the confession of our mouth, I'm telling you. My life is not always as fruitful as I wish it would be, and as a result, my joy can fluctuate if I'm only thinking in the natural realm. But if I'm thinking in the supernatural realm and I'm trusting in God, if I'm not listening to the counsel of the ungodly, guess what? I can rise up out of those situations, keep my attitude where it needs to be. I need to stay in faith. Remember what he said in James? He said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally to all men. Do you realize I think quicker than I can talk? Gives liberally to all men and upbraideth not, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, something like that. Because he said, the man that wavers, let not that man believe he'll receive anything from God. So we need to have some unwavering faith there. We need to stand and believe God. When difficult situations come on, if you're tied into God, you're planted by the rivers of living water, you might say, guess what? Uh, there's some things happening, but, I, but you don't understand. I am plugged into the vine. I'm right beside the river of living water, and God's going to meet all my needs according to his riches and glory. That door may have shut, but man, the door that's getting ready to open is going to change everything. Amen? And believe God. It says, blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the, un, uh, uh, of the wicked. What robs us of our joy sometimes, we start listening to people. You know what I'm take, talking about. Two people are having trouble in their marriage, and so he goes out to his job, and what, and what's, what do they tell him, his worker friend? Hey, man, there's a lot of other women out here. You ain't got to put up with that. And a woman goes off to her job, and she goes, man, I'm having trouble. Man, he's doing this, he's doing that. He's terrible, won't take out the trash. And what's, what's her friend say? I know a guy will take out the trash. And he looks good doing it. <laughs> but you don't get godly counsel from ungodly people. And so you can't allow that to happen. Blessed is the person who has not stood in the way of sinners. It's one thing to hear the advice of the world, but it's another to get up and stand at it, to accept it and act on it. After we've heard it, have we accepted the world's advice to be true and then acted on it? Well, maybe that's Rob gives you joy. Listen to his voice. Blessed is the person who does not sit in the seat of mockers. Are we settled in the rocker recliner of worldly wisdom? The first step away from the blessing of Christian joy is to start listening to what the world says. The next step is to act on it and start standing right there in it. And then to turn around and sit in it and rest in it. The progression from walking to standing to sitting reminds us that that even to take the first step away from godly wisdom and godly instruction, to take that step away from being Christ-centered starts robbing you of your blessing. You keep your mind focused on Jesus, amen? That's why Jesus says, remain in me. The blessed person is like a tree planted by living streams. Number three, I better move on. Blessed, we're also blessed with all blessings. But we know that because he says whatever he does prospers. When I'm plugged into God, man, every time. You know, we used to have a neighbor, and he said to me, and this is, uh, I mean, it's, it wasn't what he thought, but, he went, but, but yet what he said was true. He came over to me and said, I don't even understand you. It seems like you fall bass ackards into money. No, but I'll tell you this. Uh, there were some tough times back there, and and uh, we would confess that there was a way to pay the bills. Did you know God didn't have a counterfeit operation in heaven or rain money down in my house? I'd drive down the road. I'd see an old car or something, and God would say, buy that car. And I'd go over there, and I'd buy the car. I'd do a little tinkering on it, fix it up, make it, make it $1,500, $2,000 on it, and all of a sudden I had the money I needed for what I needed to do. How many people know that's a blessing? You start asking, to, you say, God, I need to take care of my bills. He gets you a better job. He's not raining money out of heaven. He's blessing you by giving you the opportunity to, uh, to obtain wealth. The Bible said in, in uh, 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 Deuteronomy, is that it? Where he said, you know, I've given you the power to obtain wealth. He didn't say he's going to shower it on you. He said that you're going to, whatever he, what, does prosper. 
If a guy's sitting on an, in his recliner never doing anything with his life, I'm not talking about somebody who's, who's handicapped and can't do it. I'm not talking about that. I think the church needs to take care of people who can't do it. But there's a lot of able-bodied people that sit in their recliner watching Andy Griffith sucking on a Pepsi. And they're, and they're saying, I thought whatever he does would prosper because I, like to, I love them to say that to me. Then I'll tell them, yeah, but you're not doing anything. <laughs> we have a part to play in this. I'm planted by the river of living water, but I'm listening to God, and he'll bless whatever I do. Does that make sense? We're talking about living the good life. The Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. I didn't say that. The Bible says that. I've had people come into my office. We really need help. I said, we'll help you. And then, uh, 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 and then in the midst of it, I'll find out they work. I said, well, I'll help you find a job. Well, I don't really need a job. Yeah, you do. You don't think you do, but you do. I've had people say, you told the guy to get a job? Yeah, I told him to get a job. Get your butt out there off the bed and off the couch and go to work. Amen? But when you get advice from the wicked, they're not going to teach you how to prosper in the way that God wants you to prosper. So you've got to listen to what God says. It says, so the, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. But we're going to stand in the judgment because we belong to God. And, and it tells us next that we're blessed to the highest degree, not just a little bit. The Lord watches over, in verse 6, the Lord watches over the righteous. I want to tell you, God is watching over me. He's watching the steps I take. He's leading me where I need to go. He's having me buy what I need to buy. He's having me sell what I need to sell. He's having me in relationship with people I need to be in relationship. My steps are ordered of the Lord. And so I be, I, it's easy for me to stand in faith. Can I tell you something? If I'm not doing anything God wants me to do, surely my hope will be shaken. But if I have a heart to serve God, and I have taken his word seriously, and I'm spending time with the Lord, and I'm listening to what he wants, and what he wants has become more important than what I do. What have I done? Then I've done what it said in 2 Corinthians 5. It said... Now I have laid hold of that divine favor that he's given me. The Bible said you have that favor, but you have to lay hold of it. How do you lay hold of it? By being where God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. Do you receive that from the pastor this morning? The Bible says the days of the blameless are known to the Lord, and their inheritance will endure forever, Psalms 37, 18. I love it. It calls us to make a decision. Have I decided? Well, I know God's on my side. I know God loves me. Yeah, but are, am I on his side? I've got to decide. So guess what? You have a great opportunity today. Stand to your feet. You have a great opportunity. You know what it is? You have the power to make a decision. If things haven't been going the way that you know they ought to go, but you also know that you haven't been serving the Lord, now you get to make a decision. Well, I think instead of doing it my way, maybe it would work better if I did it God's way. What do you think about that? Amen? Amen. You know what the problem is in, in decision making? Many times people talk about a decision. It's like they've drawn a line and, and, and they go back and forth and back and forth. Well, you're unstable in all your way. But you can have a clear line where in your life you decide this is the day I'm done doing things my way. I'm going to do things God's way. Let me have my leaders come forward. Hallelujah. If you're in that place where today you'd say, listen, I'm done doing things my way. I'm going to do things God's way. Won't you come forward? You don't have to come forward, but you come forward. You'll talk to somebody, and I just want you to tell them, I've been doing things my way but I want to do it God's way. And you two pray together and come into agreement together. Amen? Hallelujah. God is your answer. Well, let's do our regular song, Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Help me on my 
turning Help me on my way Oh, Lord, I want you to help me While I'm praying I want you to help me Help me on my way Oh, Lord, won't you to help me Let's just say while I'm singing Raise your hand While I'm singing Won't you to help me Oh, Lord Why Even times when you pray, the answer's on its way, and you get impatient, and you try to do things your own way. But listen, when you pray, he said, call on me and I will answer. So we're going to sing, while I'm waiting, I want you to help me. While I'm waiting, I want you to help me. I know somebody felt like moving forward and they didn't do that and we want to pray with you uh, no matter what you're going through whether it's a physical illness uh, no matter what it is I want, I want you to know what did he say he said everything we do will prosper I mean God has given us his favor he wants you to walk in health and wealth and, and, and uh, he wants you to have peace inside of your life he wants you to live a good life because he is glorified when we're successful he's glorified amen so he wants you to do that we're going to sing it one more time and you who are sitting back there saying i ought to get prayer come up and get prayer
Father, I thank you right now that the people that are in this room right now who've heard this message have made a heart decision not to be just halfway for you, but to be sold out, to love you with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I thank you, Lord. They've made a decision. This is the day they've decided they're sold out to you, Lord. I thank you. Now, Father, I thank you that bodies in here who've been dealing with illness, illness are being made well right now, Lord God. I thank you and I praise you for that. I thank you, Lord God, that hearts that have been broken because your word said you, uh, he came to heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. I thank you that your broken hearts are being healed right now. I thank you and I praise you for that. I thank you that you're restoring hope in people right now, Lord God. I thank you that we are the people that are planted beside the river of living water and all that we do prospers. We listen to what you say and not what the world says. So we are more and more like you, Jesus, every day. And everyone says uh, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we got food today. I forgot. It's, it's family day. Father, we thank you for the food we're getting ready to take. Uh, I, I believe it's all good. <laughs> but not only that, I think it's good for our body. Uh, we bless it right now so it brings nourishment to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Yeah.